You always look so sad, pup. It's the last day of 2023. Mama and the kiddo are at church, so we got a little time to kill. I thought we could make kind of a, a roundup video. I'll give you an update on some of the projects and we'll talk about what happened with the YouTube channel and where I see it going in the coming year. It's gonna be kind of a lot of talking and not a lot of working, so if that's not your cup of tea, no big deal. We'll see you on the next one. Let's start with the shop itself. My big project this year was to fix the floor. I had a low spot right about there. It was actually down about five inches. And I brought in a company that does mud jacking and they pumped about five tons of mortar under the slab and raised it back up. Now level wise, it's not that great. I still have a low spot there and now I have high spots kind of all around the outside perimeter of the old low spot. And he told me that would happen. It's kind of unavoidable. When the slab settles, you know, the rebar bends, and then when they pump it up, it kind of stays bent. But the good news is the concrete is stable now. I can put up more lifts or park heavy machines back here. It shouldn't be a problem. I do have a lot of, a lot more cracks now but it's still a massive improvement and it was a whole lot cheaper and less disruptive than tearing this floor out and trying to replace it. Next, we're gonna take down this two post lift. I actually sold that to one of my customers and I've got two Challenger two post lifts to put up probably in this area, closer to the door. It makes no sense to have the lift back here. I just put it there because that's the only place where the floor was strong enough to support it. I've gotten a lot of questions about this big pile of lumber and the other building materials. The plan is to tear down this loft area and rebuild it. It's going to be the same size in the same location, but a whole lot stronger because this thing is pretty sketchy. The floor joists are two by sixes, 24 inches on center. It's kind of like walking on a trampoline and it's not nearly strong enough to you know, store anything or even really occupy the, the second floor. So the plan is to insulate and finish the ground floor as kind of an office and an electronics area and then storage up above. The plan is to use these engineered floor joists. I had to special order these. It took about two months to get them but they're the strongest beam I could get with the shortest possible height. The ceiling is just over 16 feet, so I'm trying to get the most headroom I can on the second floor. I bought a whole trailer full of knockdown steel shelving about a year ago. That's gonna go in the mezzanine, hopefully soon. It's getting pretty rusty. That's all the insulation, drywall, subfloor, and sheeting. We should have everything we need to build a, a 12 by 16 office and storage area. I really need an office, you know, a place for my desk and my computer and my camera gear and the electronics bench. This setup is, is not ideal. You know, there's the welding area right there. So it's always covered in dust. And anytime I open the door, the papers blow everywhere. Plus we can heat it and possibly even air condition it. That would be nice. I've got to do a little bit of wiring and I've never had plumbing for compressed air. I'm still using hoses on the floor. I bought this kit over a year ago. I would like to get that put up. With the lift out of here, I can rearrange this whole area of the shop. I think we're gonna switch it around. I'll move the welding stuff back into the corner and then move the machine tools up into this area. And then all the stuff that's over here, it's gonna have to find a new home. The tire machines and the brake lathe can move up here where the lift's gonna be. And then I think we're gonna to have to get rid of the steel rack. I've moved it a couple times and there just is no good place for it. It takes up so much space. It's really nice for the 20 footers and 24 footers, but I don't have a whole lot of those. I think I'd be better off to just build a single rack up high for the 20 footers and then take all the 12 footers and store them vertically and then just get rid of this thing. Yeah, I hate to, but man, it takes up so much space. Let's talk about equipment. 
I've got some new stuff you guys might not have seen. I sold my old Dinosaur Miller 330 ABP and I bought this beautiful ESOB Heliarc 252 square wave TIG welder. I paid 900 bucks for it and then I spent about twice that much more to buy the torch, the pedal, the cooler, and the regulator. So maybe that wasn't such a good deal. But this is a fantastic welder, especially for aluminum. It just, it lays down beautiful beads. I picked up this old Van Dorn valve grinder. It's a little rough, but it does work. Uh, but the cool thing is this cabinet, this is an original Sioux valve grinder cabinet. And I wouldn't be surprised if that thing's 100 years old. It's still got the original graphics. And inside, it still has a lot of the original pilots and stones. Yeah, the cabinet itself is worth probably more than I paid for the whole setup. I bought this old Boyer Schultz 6x12 surface grinder from a local guy. And I kind of wish I hadn't. This thing is pretty well clapped out. The main feed shaft here was all worn out and the bearings were falling apart. So I took it all apart and took some measurements. You can't buy parts for it. You got to make everything, which is not a big deal. I bought all the materials to do it. But in the meantime, I learned that the spindle bearings are bad. And then kind of the big problem is the table ways are worn so badly that the whole thing has settled down to the point that the uh, the rack and pinion it kind of jams against the pinion and you can't feed it smoothly so to fix this machine I'd have to still rebuild the shaft build up the ways probably with turkite or something and then replace the spindle bearings and then I would still have a 6x12 manual surface grinder so I don't think it's I don't think it's worth it I'll probably just scrap this machine or if somebody wants it for parts or something let me know I, I don't think it's worth fixing unfortunately you think I would know how to spot a clapped out machine tool but apparently I don't longtime viewers will remember I used to do a lot with CNC machines and I kind of got burned out on it but this was my year to kind of get back in the saddle. I bought the Prusa 3D printer and I've been having a lot of fun with that. I have run into some limitations though and I think I would like to have a resin printer. So I'm kind of researching that now. If anybody knows, you know, what I should look for or what's a good one. The Form 3 looks really nice. It's also very expensive. So I don't know, I'm just kind of feeling it out right now. CNC machine number two was this Niji Max 4 diode laser. I haven't used it a whole lot, but I've used it enough to know that lasers are pretty awesome. Awesome enough that I bought this 90 watt CO2 laser to replace it. This thing is a beast. It's all enclosed. It's got a exhaust fan so you're not getting smoked out all the time. There's a compressor and a chiller even has an extra CO2 tube. I bought it off Facebook for not much money. I haven't used it, but I know it works and it's a beast. Last but not least, the Crossfire CNC Plasma Cutter. That is probably not the best place to store your fuel right next to the several thousand degree plasma arc. Anyway, this thing is pretty awesome for the most part. There are some problems. I wish it was bigger. Literally my first job, which was rebuilding the skid steer bucket, had a part that was too big to fit on this table. That's kind of a balancing act of taking up shop space versus being big enough to do what you want to do. I wish it was bigger. Number two, the water table is kind of a pain in the butt. It just sprays dirty water everywhere the whole time you're using it. The whole floor is covered with it and there's no way to avoid that as far as I can tell. The other problem is the water table itself is made up of two pieces that are bolted together with silicone between them 
and it lasted about a month before it started leaking. So I don't know what we're going to do about that. We might try to weld them together, but it's thin stainless steel, and stainless is pretty tricky to weld, especially a long weld like that. I think we could, we could easily get in trouble. Uh, the other problem I've had is that the water and the debris from the cut sprays up onto the vertical slide here, and it jams up the vertical movement of the torch for the torch height control. I've had a couple of times where it, you know, it tried to strike the arc, you know, this far above the piece of material because it got jammed up and couldn't reach, couldn't reach where it was supposed to reach to touch off. So I don't know what we're going to do about that. Maybe build some kind of a shield or something. But otherwise, it's been great. It's nice to be able to just cut out whatever I want. Speaking of which, I do have about 20 of these logo plates left. If anybody wants one, check out our website. I can paint them if you want them painted. I don't think I've really talked about this guy. It's a cheap Chinese box and pan brake. I bought this used to go with my plasma cutter, thinking I could do sheet metal work. And it works, but I don't know. 18 gauge and thinner, it does a pretty good job. It says you can bend 16 gauge, and you can, but you don't get very good results. But it's a lot cheaper and takes up a lot less space than a press brake. I may have already purchased two more CNC machines. One's pretty small, but the other one is, well, you'll have to wait and see. Let's talk about projects, ongoing and upcoming. The big one is the robot log skitter. You guys seem to like this thing, which is good because I like it too. I've had a lot of comments from people asking, you know, what am I going to do with it? What's the point of it? Why bother? I mean, just look at it. This thing is absolutely adorable. I can't look at it without smiling. Uh, spoiler alert, I did get the hydraulics working thanks to some help from the comment section. People helped me get my brain untangled. I am working on building my own remote control. We're going to start with a wired remote and then hopefully move into wireless. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of options, but I want to try building my own just as a challenge. And, you know, it's going to be tricky because I'm working at the limits of my abilities. I'm going to have to build a custom circuit board and do a lot of programming and stuff that's kind of outside of my my normal realm of expertise. But I think we'll get it. And that'll be cool. This thing is it's just awesome. The Clark forklift is leaking like crazy. All the mast cylinders are leaking. This one here is completely blown out. The other two are dripping pretty good too. I've got new seals. I just haven't had time to put them in. It runs good, drives good, but it is I'll admit, pretty ugly. I'm thinking about painting it. And I hate painting. I'm terrible at it. But I think I'm going to try. So let me know if that's something that you want to see. The Ford Triple Nickel Backhoe. I actually used it this year as a backhoe, but it's not very handy because it doesn't drive. It runs in backhoes, but Something major is wrong with the drivetrain. It will not move. So I would like to get started on that pretty soon. But I think before we do that, we got to work on this guy. This is a 580C, I think, case backhoe. Belongs to my neighbor. Needs a bunch of work. The cylinder there is blown out on the other side. This loader cylinder is blown out. Needs a complete service. Somebody swapped a Cummins engine into it, which is kind of cool. Yeah, we should be able to knock this one out pretty quickly. The Thomas Skid Steer. I bought this about a year ago. It's fantastic. It runs good, drives good. The new bucket is working out great. I still haven't painted it, which I will do eventually. We need to work on the quick catch plate. The bottom pins are worn out. And this is not a universal quick-tatch. 
which is kind of a problem if I want to use the normal Bobcat style attachments. So I've got a plan to cut it down and modify it to make it work with the standard, the standard style. I just haven't had time to do it. And then the pins, we might have to break out my, my homemade line boring machine, which I don't think you guys have ever seen. Look at this sad state of affairs. The poor Honda Goldwing. So the story on this bike, it's been wrecked. It belonged to one of my wife's coworkers. He blew the tire out and endoed it and it just about killed him. And I was just helping him move it to the scrapyard. They were gonna junk it. And long story short, it ended up here. It was inside the shop all winter last winter. And I finally moved it out here in the spring. I just decided I was never going to get to it. And it's been sitting here ever since. And then I think on Christmas Eve, we had a big bunch of wind and it blew it over. And then I picked up this other bike here. It's an older Goldwing, just for parts. The engine's all taken apart on it. But it blew over too. So, yeah. Someday, we're going to work on these. I want to see if I can get this one running. I don't know if we can drive it. It's got a ton of miles on it. And like I said, it's been wrecked, but there might be something we can do with it. This Mayrath auger, it's been sitting here for like three months. The bearing's all worn out on the bottom. I gotta fix it. I just have not had time, which the owner is not happy about. The Volkswagen, still sitting here. Still runs, still drives. I just can't make myself scrap it. The floor is completely trashed. The body is, uh, it should not go back on the road. Let's put it that way. But I do have a project in mind for it, so I'm keeping it around. This is the remains of a moped. I had a customer who was gonna trade me some work for this. He took it apart to paint it, but he lost the engine. So I don't know what to do with it. He left it here. I never did the work. He never came back to get it, and nobody ever found the engine. So it's just kind of sitting here. This guy, I don't think I've talked about. This is a 2000 Ford F350. It's got a 7.3 Power Stroke diesel engine. I bought this for 1500 bucks. It has a ton of miles, but it has a reman engine with paperwork. It's only got about 20,000 miles on it. It sat in a barn for a couple of years. I drove it home, and it's been sitting here for a couple of years. I, just, I don't know if I'm ever going to get to it. I even put license plates on it and paid for registration for a whole year and still didn't get time to work on it. My plan was to get it running and fix up the chassis and then swap the body and service bed from that truck. It's got a locked up 5.4 gas engine, but the body and the service bed are pretty good on it. But I don't know if I'm going to ever have time to get that done. On the subject of projects I don't have time for. The 770 Oliver. It's still here. It's still in the same condition it was the last time you saw it. So if you haven't seen this tractor, I got it from my neighbor. We tried to get it running. The engine was locked up. They took the muffler off to put it in the barn and the mice got in the exhaust manifold and seized it up. It needs the engine rebuilt. I took it apart, but that was during COVID and I could not get parts for it. I mean, they just did not exist. I think I probably could get parts for it now, but it's been sitting outside here, you know, with the head off for what, four years. So I don't know if it would be worth fixing it at this point. It's got a lot of other problems. The power steering is kind of a mess. They took out the multi-power and made it direct drive. Plus it's a narrow front gas tractor. They just aren't worth much. And the loaders, it's not mine. It, I had to bring that back to him. So I don't know. My other neighbor wants to buy it for parts. I might just sell it to him. I've got a lot of projects and I was feeling kind of bad about never getting them done. And then I watched Matt's video, Mr. Diesel Creek. Holy crap. That guy's got a lot of stuff. Gives me anxiety just thinking about it. Uh, let's talk about the channel. And I promise I will try not to make this the seven millionth YouTuber complains about YouTube video. Nobody cares about that. Uh, we're doing fine. 
is my opinion. Everything's been pretty steady for the last three years. We gained some subscribers, but as far as views and watch time and revenue and all that stuff, it's pretty even over the last three years. And I don't know if that's good or bad, but it works for me. Obviously, I would like it to be better, but I don't know if I know how to do that. So as long as it's not going down, I'm okay with it. I would say the big problem with the YouTube channel is right here. It's me. More specifically, it's my brain. And I don't know what's wrong with my brain, but I have come to the conclusion that it does not work the way that normal people's brains work. And I don't mean that in a good way. Sometimes it's advantageous. You know, I'm pretty good at like out of the box thinking and picking up things pretty quickly. But most of the time, it's just a pain in the ass. And I wish that it worked the way normal people's brains work. I think it would really help me. Uh, but maybe you guys can help me by using your normal brains to tell me what to do. So I've been experimenting over the last year. Maybe you guys can tell, maybe you couldn't. I've been trying some different things, just kind of throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks. And always my goal has been to try to make the kind of videos that I would want to watch. And the videos that I like are educational, somewhat technical, but not too far into the weeds to where I can't follow what's going on, humorous, got to have something funny for me to be interested, and well edited. And I think kind of the overall theme of that is that I don't want to feel like whoever made the video is wasting my time. And that's what I try to do with my videos. I don't want to waste people's time. So as far as editing goes, I try to be pretty ruthless. If there's Nothing that's moving the story along, I cut it out. I don't do intros. I don't do a lot of talking at the beginning. I don't try not to do a whole lot of talking at the end. Just the facts. And I've also tried to kind of add in some, I don't want to say scripted, but kind of giving myself more of an outline and a storyline to follow to make sure that I hit all the points so that whatever I'm doing makes sense. And I've been playing around with things like music and stuff like that, trying to make a more kind of a more polished video. And reactions have been mixed. Some people really like it. Some people absolutely hate it and have no problem telling me that. Uh, but the vast majority of people just do not care. I don't even know if they notice. It doesn't matter to them. And that's kind of interesting. I didn't expect that. Uh, yeah, there's not a lot of, in my opinion, well edited or well put together videos in this genre. And I think the reason is nobody cares. It's, <laughs> there's not a demand for it. I don't know. I mean, there are people like Neil Kof, for example, he has very well edited videos. He always has you know, a very well thought out storyline. So they exist. It's just the exception rather than the rule. And I think that's just because it doesn't matter. Uh, anyway, I was looking at my, my list of my top 10 videos for this year. And it's kind of interesting. So it's a mix. There's three will it run videos, four regular shop repair videos, and two diagnostics. And there's a couple of shorts and some other weird stuff in there. Uh, the Will It Run videos always do well. Uh, maybe we should double down and just make this a Will It Run channel. I don't know. Those guys seem to do really well. Uh, the shop repairs, uh, those are pretty easy videos for me to make. The thing is, they're very hit or miss on whether they're going to do well. And I still don't have any way to predict what shop repair video is going to do well in the YouTube algorithm. And then the diagnostics, those are fun videos. Those are probably my favorite ones to make. But the problem with that is they're even more hit or miss because it just depends on what rolls through the door. And if you get something cool, it makes a cool video. But there can be long times where you don't get anything, you know, anything exciting. Anyway, 
you guys tell me that there's something that you want to see, let me know and I'll see what I can do. Uh, it seems like the videos where I build something don't do very well. And maybe that's just because I'm trying to get too far out of my wheelhouse. I'm not sure. I think maybe what I'm going to do going forward is we'll carry on with this channel the way that it is, not make any big changes. I may not spend a whole lot of time editing videos anymore because it just doesn't seem to be helping anything. If anything, it might be hurting me. And then the project videos, things I want to build, I will do on my second channel. And we'll just kind of turn that into the build channel. So this channel will just continue along and it will basically feed the second channel where I can do long-term projects and not have to worry so much about the algorithm forgetting who I am. Speaking of the algorithm, something else that's kind of interesting, four of my top 10 videos for 2023 were not made in 2023. Three of them were made in 2022, and one was made in 2021. That can't be normal. So normally, when you drop a YouTube video, your best views are the first 24 hours. And then the curve just starts going down, 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 down. And after about the first week, you should have 80%, 90% of the total views that that video is ever going to get. And if I'm looking at these analytics correctly, uh, some of my videos got more views the second year than the first year they were published. That seems like a problem. So I don't know if I'm doing something wrong with my titles or thumbnails and people aren't seeing the videos and they're being recommended to them much later, or if my content is just so willy-nilly that nobody can really tell what I'm going to be posting and they don't know whether they should watch my videos or not. I don't know. So you guys tell me. It seems like what we should do is be more focused, be less polished, try to make more videos, and probably try to make them longer because that seems to be the thing that everybody wants. Everybody wants more videos, longer videos. So, yeah, if that's what people want, you know, I don't want to make these videos if nobody's going to watch them. You guys tell me. Engage your normal brains. Connect them to your normal fingers. Type out some comments and tell me if you think we're doing okay or if we should make some changes. I am 100% open to suggestions. So, yeah, I think that's all I've got to say. Thanks, everybody, for watching. You guys are what make this YouTube thing possible. I never thought I would get to this point. I mean, honestly, I don't have any kind of plan because I never planned to get this far. So, yeah, it's quite a humbling experience. Happy New Year's. Thanks for watching.